In this course, you're going to learn the absolute basics of Kubernetes with videos that simplify and break down complex concepts. If you are a visual learner, this course is for you. And you'll also gain real hands-on experience through our labs. They say we retain 30% of what we see, but more than 80% of what we experience by doing. There is no better way to learn than to learn by doing. So our labs ensure you gain enough practice. We'll start with a quick introduction to containers, and then we'll understand why you need container orchestration, what Kubernetes is, and then dive into Kubernetes concepts such as pods, replica sets, deployments, services, and finally, a project on deploying a microservices application to a Kubernetes cluster. So here's how I recommend you to take this course. This course is about two hours of video and two hours of lab time. And by the end of this course, you should aim to get a high level understanding of Kubernetes, not just theory, but with hands-on practice. Each concept taught in this video is followed by hands-on labs. Our labs open up right in your browser and it comes absolutely free with this course. So there's no time needed to spend on setting up your own environments. You go from watching a video to practicing it in less than 30 seconds. The labs are challenge-based and each lab is specifically designed to help you practice the concepts you just learned in the video. So set aside four hours of your time for this video turn off notifications on your mobile phone, turn off any desktop notifications like Slack or email and any other distractions and get in the zone and make sure you're ready to block out a few hours of your time and aim to stick to our curriculum and our labs and finish this course. As Robin Sharma says, starting strong is good, but finishing strong is epic. You wanna make sure that you don't just start this course, but you also finish it. That's why we have created this seamless experience with videos followed by hands-on labs. My name is Mumshad Manambath, and I'll be your instructor for this course, and welcome to CodeCloud. Okay, so before we begin, head over to this link to download the deck used in this course, so you can keep a local copy of, for your own reference, as well as to access the labs that comes uh, free with this course. So go to code.wiki, slash Kubernetes dash labs or scan this QR code. And once you're on this page, click on enroll in this course to enroll in the course for free. Uh, once enrolled in the course, you have two sections, uh, one for downloading resources and the other for the hands-on labs. Okay, and go to the download resources section to download the PDF. Click on the link to download a local version of the PDF. So this comes with all the slides and all the notes and transcripts of what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this course. In the hands-on lab section, you have access to the labs. And when you go into the labs, uh, click on the start lab button to start a lab. Now don't do this right now, because as we go through this course, I'm going to tell you exactly when to access which lab. So this is just for you to know how the labs are organized. And after each lab, you also kind of have the solution video where we talk about how to solve those particular labs. But yeah, just so you know, the labs open up right in your browser, you have a terminal and you have a set of questions to answer. And yep, so that's it for now. And um, let's start with the first topic in this course. Let's start by refreshing our memory on containers. So that's you and you're developing an application on your laptop. Say it's written in Python and it has certain dependencies such as the Flask mm -hmm. framework for serving a website. You're also working on another part of the application, which is a separate, uh, built as a separate app, say a payment service. And that also uses the Flask framework, but relies on a different version of the library. So we have the first app that uses the 2.2 version and this one using the 2.1 version. Applications typically add many such packages and dependencies as they grow and they may all be different in different applications. And that's going to be a challenge if you're trying to run the same application on the same machine. Now, certain programming languages provide solutions to tackle these. For example, Python has the Python virtual environments concept that helps isolate Python packages into virtual environments. That way you can have different versions of dependencies in different virtual environments. However, that doesn't help you separate dependencies outside of the programming language libraries. For example, your app may rely on a specific package on the operating system, such as, say, the glib system library or utilities like curl. What if your application relies on certain binaries and packages and certain versions of binaries and packages on the system, and these are different between different applications? It's going to be hard to manage different versions of dependencies on the same OS. Moreover, let's say you bring in a friend to help you develop the application. 
That person needs to set up the exact same environment in the exact same way with the exact same versions of dependencies and libraries. And if the other person uses a completely different operating system, then a whole different nightmare awaits. Now you'll need to figure out what the different dependencies are for that operating system if now you have a different operating system to handle. Now, we've only been talking about development environment for now. What happens when the application is deployed to a test environment or to a production environment? You'll have to make sure you set up the environment in the exact same way with the exact same dependencies. If you change something in the development environment, you'll have to make sure it gets updated in the test and prod environments as well. Otherwise, things end up working in one environment and not working in the other. And no matter how much you try, it's impossible to make sure that these environments remain the same. At some point in time, someone is going to make a change to a dependency or add another dependency and forget to update them in other environments and things are going to break. Now, what if you could build an image that consists of the app itself and all of its dependencies at both the app level and the system level and package it and use the exact same image in all of the different environments? That way, anytime you make a change in the future, the image is rebuilt and the same image is used in all of the different environments. No more differences between the various environments. So that's what containers can help us with. Containers help us create isolated environments on our systems to run applications completely isolated from each other. You could run a different web application with the different versions of dependencies or a PostgreSQL server, or a MySQL server, or a Red server, all on the same system with their own libraries and dependencies, but not worrying about any impact to each other. And each of these may be based on different operating systems too. For example, um, containers allow you to build images based on specific operating systems, and then add all the system level and application level dependencies to it to finally have a lean and clean image for each application that only has what that application needs within those image and that can run anywhere. On your Linux machine, you can run any of these applications even if they are based on a different OS flavor. Your local uh, laptop could be Ubuntu, but you could run an image that's built using Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, or any other Linux operating system. One of the most popular tools to containerize applications and run containers is Docker. So here we have our application code then we have the requirements.txt file, which has all the dependencies that are required for the application. In our case, it's just the Flask dependency. And we now build a Docker file to package the application with its dependencies into a Docker container. So the first line here creates an image from the Python base image and then sets the right uh, working directory, then copies the requirements.txt file to the working directory, and then installs the dependencies. And this is where you could add any other dependency to it and then copies the application code into the image and finally defines the command to run the application using the CMD instruction. Now, by running the docker build command, we build an image. And by running the docker run command, we run one instance of our application. So that was a quick introduction to containers and docker. If you are new to Docker, I would recommend checking out our free Docker for Beginners course on CodeCloud using the link given here. You'll learn with hands-on labs using our interactive learning environment by working on real systems that's exclusive to you. So what is Kubernetes? With Docker, you are able to run a single instance of an application using the Docker run command, which is great. Running an application has never been so easy before. With Kubernetes, using the Kubernetes CLI known as kubectl, you can run a thousand instances of the same application with a single command. Kubernetes can scale it up to 2000 with another command. Kubernetes can even be configured to do these automatically so that instances and the infrastructure itself can scale up and down based on user load. Kubernetes can upgrade these 2000 instances of application in a rolling fashion one at a time with a single command. And if something goes wrong, it can help you roll back these images with a single command. Kubernetes can help you test new features of your application by only upgrading a percentage of these instances through A-B testing methods. Now, don't worry about the command line tool for now. We will take a closer look at it very soon. With Kubernetes, you're also able to define the expected state of your application. For example, you're able to define that your application consists of four different services. The web server must have three instances running, 
the payment service to have two. There should be a Redis service with three instances running and a database service to which these services connect to. And you're able to define these in code and Kubernetes will ensure that the state that you have defined in these files for your application is maintained at all times. So if things go down, if something's changed, Kubernetes will ensure that your application gets back to this state, the declarative state that's defined in these files at all times. So we'll look at how it, it works and how it happens and examples of this later in this video. But for now, we're just going to take a high level look at the Kubernetes cluster itself. So let's start with nodes. A node is a machine, physical or virtual, on which Kubernetes is installed. A node is a worker machine, and this is where containers uh, will be launched by Kubernetes. But what if the node on which your application is running fails? Well, obviously, our application goes down, so you need to have more than one node. A cluster is a set of nodes grouped together. This way, even if one node fails, you have your application still accessible from the other nodes. Moreover, having multiple nodes helps in sharing load between the nodes as well. Now, we have a cluster, but who is responsible for managing the cluster? Where is the information about the members of the cluster stored and how are the nodes monitored? And when a node fails, how do you move the workload of that failed node to another worker node? That's where the control plane comes in, also previously known as the master node. The control plane is another node with Kubernetes components installed in it. The control plane watches over the nodes in the cluster and is responsible for the actual orchestration of containers on the worker nodes. Now, when you install Kubernetes on a system, you're actually installing the following components, an API server and a CD service, controllers and schedulers. The API server acts as the front end for Kubernetes. The users, management devices, third-party tools, command line interfaces, all talk to the API server to interact with Kubernetes cluster. Next is the etcd key store. Etcd is a distributed reliable key value store used by Kubernetes to store all data used to manage the cluster. This is where information about the nodes in the cluster, the application running on the cluster, and any other information are stored. The controllers are the brain behind orchestration. They're responsible for noticing and responding when nodes, containers, or endpoints go down. The controllers make decisions to bring up new containers in such cases. The scheduler is responsible for distributing work or containers across multiple nodes. It looks for newly created containers and assigns them to nodes. On the worker nodes, you have the kubelet, which is the agent that runs on each node in the cluster. This agent is responsible for making sure that the containers are running on the nodes as expected. You also have the kube proxy that is responsible for maintaining rules on the nodes. The kube proxy helps in to communicate with each other, the worker nodes and the containers to communicate between each other. So it's more of a networking component. On the worker nodes, you also have container runtime that is responsible for running containers because ultimately that's why we want the cluster to run applications in the form of containers. And one example of that container runtime is Docker. Now, it used to be Docker for a long time in the past because Kubernetes was originally built to orchestrate Docker containers specifically. However, over a period of time, it evolved to support other container runtimes. So it no longer supports Docker directly, but supports the runtime component of Docker, which today is managed by container D. So there is a separate video that where we talk about the whole story of Kubernetes and Docker and how they started together and what changed. So check it out in the link given below. So going forward, we're going to refer to a container runtime in Kubernetes as container D. And that's the high level architecture of a Kubernetes cluster. And next we will look into the Kubernetes CLI. Let's take a look at the kube control utility. Kube control is the command line utility of Kubernetes. This is the tool or command you would use to operate the Kubernetes cluster, such as to view the status of the cluster, to provision applications, to scale up, scale down, delete, and many other things. One of the questions I get asked often is how to pronounce this. Different people pronounce it differently. Some say kubectl, others say kube control, some say kube cuddle, others say kube cuddle. The canonical pronunciation is kube control. So I'll try and stick to that. Now, I myself have changed the way I pronounce it over the years. Cube cuddle came easy to me, so you'll hear me say that at times too. So forgive me if you hear me mix it up 
at different times. So now that it is out of the way, let's get started. To identify the version of the kubectl client and the Kubernetes server, run the kubectl version command. This lists the client and the server version along with the version of any other tool installed that's Kubernetes related tool installed in the system. The help option lists basic help information such as the basic commands that can be run. Uh, we will dig into these commands later in the video, but it's good to run this command and go around and understand some of the basic commands that, that are listed here. Let's begin with a few very simple commands. To see a list of nodes in your cluster, run the kubectl get nodes command. The output shows you the name of the node, its status, the roles, how long the machine has been up and the version of Kubernetes running on that system. To get a more verbose output with more details, such as the internal IP, the OS image, kernel version, container runtime, etc., run the same command, but with the dash O wide option. It's time to gain hands-on experience with the CodeCloud Labs. This course is designed for you to have a seamless experience from start to finish. And that's why we have labs after each concept that will help you gain hands-on experience on exactly what you learned until then. So to begin with, we're going to work on an existing Kubernetes cluster that's already set up. And this will help you get familiarized with the cluster, the Kubernetes command line interface, uh, deploy applications to the cluster with pods, deployments and services, etc. And at the end of this course, we'll share instructions on setting up your own local environment for you to continue your studies. We do not want you to be distracted with any issues that might come up when you try to build your own cluster locally. So my recommendation is to aim to complete this course only using our labs and go from start to finish without any interruption. If this is a two hours course, you should aim to complete it in two hours or four hours max. So head over to the labs using the links given below and come back here once you're done to resume the course. Okay, so it's time to start working on the labs. Now, in case you haven't uh, done it already, go to this link to access the labs in this course. So go to code.wiki slash Kubernetes labs or scan this QR code. So once you go to this link, you have this free course where you can download the resources as well as access the hands-on labs. So now we're gonna start with the first lab. So click on the start course button, go to the first lab or whichever lab it is that I'll ask you to access and then click on the start lab button to load the lab. So give it about 20 seconds or so for the lab to load. Okay, so it's, it's loaded. And now you have a terminal on the right. So this is where, this is an actual terminal to a Kubernetes cluster. And on the left, you have some questions. So this is the first lab. So there are only three questions, very simple and straightforward. And the goal is for you to identify the number of nodes as part of the cluster. And here you have hints where you can get some uh, ideas or hints for uh, resolving this, right? So in this case, the question is to get the number of nodes in the cluster. So I'm going to run a kubectl get nodes command. And it tells me that there's only a, one node and that's a control plane node. So in this case, the answer is one. So the same way, follow through the commands and uh, try to identify the commands to run to get the uh, information for each of these questions. Some of them are multiple choice questions. Others are stuff where you'll have to actually make changes to the cluster, like create a, a deployment or a pod or a deploy an application. So depending on what lab you are on, the tasks will change. You can expand the terminal to full screen like this, or if you need more space, if you just want to adjust it, you can adjust it like this. And if you want to reset the lab, click on this button to reset. If you are done with the lab, click on the stop lab button to end the lab session. All right, awesome. Thank you so much and uh, wish you all the best. So it's time for our first hands-on labs activity. Use the link given here to access the lab. As mentioned before, the labs come free of cost with this course. So all you need to do is sign up for the free course using the link given here and start the lab named familiarize with the lab environment. In this lab, you will use the cube control commands to identify the cluster setup and the nodes that are available in it. Once you're done with the lab, come back and resume the course from here. Let's take a look at Kubernetes pods now. But before we begin, we would like to assume that the following have been set up already. At this point, we assume that the application is already developed and built into Docker images, and it is available on a Docker repository like Docker Hub. So Kubernetes can pull it down. We also assume that the Kubernetes cluster has already been set up and is working. Now, as we discussed before with Kubernetes, our ultimate aim is to deploy our application in the form of containers on a set of machines that are configured as worker nodes in a cluster. However, Kubernetes 
does not deploy containers directly on the worker nodes. The containers are encapsulated into a Kubernetes object known as pods. A pod is a single instance of an application. A pod is the smallest object that you can create in Kubernetes. So what happens when you want to scale it up? Do you add more containers to the pod? No, you create more pods. Typically, an application instance running as a container has a one-to-one -one relationship with a pod. To create more instances of application, you create more pods. However, the one-to-one -one relationship is not a strict rule. It is a common practice to have a helper container or a sidecar container, as it's also known, along with the main application. This could be an agent that collects logs or monitors the application and reports to a third party. And that's absolutely fine. Let us now look at how to create pods. For this, we run the kube control run command. We specify a name for the pod and the image to be used to create the pod. What this command really does is it deploys a container by creating a pod. So it first creates a pod automatically and deploys an instance of the nginx docker image. But where does it get the application image from? For that, you need to specify the image name using the image parameter like this. The application image, in this case, the nginx image, is downloaded from Docker Hub repository. Docker Hub is a public repository where latest Docker images of various applications are stored. You could configure Kubernetes to pull the image from public Docker Hub or a private repository within your organization. So now that we have a pod created, how do we see the list of pods available? The kubectl get pods command helps us see the list of pods in our cluster. In this case, we see the pod is in a container creating state and it soon changes to a running state when the application is actually running. Also remember that we haven't really talked about the concepts on how a user can access the Nginx web server. And so in the current state, we haven't made the web server accessible to external users. You can access it internally from the node. For now, we will just see how to deploy a pod. And in the later lecture, once we learn about networking and services, we will get to know how to make this service accessible to end users. So that was the imperative way of creating an object in Kubernetes. You run a command to create one object at a time. And when there are many objects and services in your application, this is not a viable option. The more preferred approach is the declarative way where you create a YAML file with the specifications of the object, the pod in this case, and have Kubernetes apply that configuration. So this way you can define the state of your application and its services as code and store it in source code repositories and version them. This approach enables version control, CICD, and sharing these with others and collaborating together on preparing these files. If you are new to YAML, check out our free course on YAML and JSON available on CodeCloud. There are hands-on activities that can help you get very comfortable with YAML soon because it's going to be an important part for the rest of this course. So head over, complete the free course and come back here. Now we will learn how to develop YAML files specifically for Kubernetes. So Kubernetes uses YAML files as input for the creation of objects such as pods, replica sets, deployment services, etc. Now all of these uh, follow a very similar structure. A Kubernetes definition file always contains four top level fields, the API version, kind, metadata, and spec. These are top level or root level properties. Think of them as siblings, children of the same parent. These are all required fields, so you must have them in your configuration file. Let us look at each one of them. The first one is the API version. This is the version of the Kubernetes API we're using to create the object. Depending on what we are trying to create, we must use the right API version. For now, since we are working on pods, we will set the API version as we want. If you're creating a service replica set or deployments, you will use the versions listed here. We will see what these are later in this course. The next is the kind. The kind refers to the type of object we are creating, which in this case happens to be a pod. So we will set it to pod. Now remember that the kind is type or case sensitive. So you wanna make sure you use the exact kind as it is listed here. If you use all small case or all caps, then it's going to error out. Some other possible values here could be replica set or deployment or service, which is what you see in the kind field in the table on the right. The next field is metadata. The metadata is data about 
the object like its name, labels, etc. As you can see, unlike the first two where you specified a string value, this is in the form of a dictionary. So everything under metadata is intended to the right a little bit. And so names and labels are children of metadata. The number of spaces before the two properties, name and labels, doesn't really matter, but they should be the same as their siblings. In this case, labels have more spaces on the left than name, and so it is now a child of the name property instead of a sibling, and that's wrong. Also, the two properties must have more spaces than its parent, which is metadata, so that it's intended to the right a little bit. But in this case, all the three have the same number of spaces before them, so they are siblings, which is not correct. Now, under metadata, the name is a string value, so you can name your pod, my app pod, and the labels is a dictionary. So labels is a dictionary within the metadata dictionary, and it can have any key and value pairs as you wish. For now, I have added a label app with the value my app. Similarly, you could add other labels as you see fit, which will help you identify these objects at a later point in time. So say for example, there are hundreds of pods running a front-end applications and other hundreds of them running backend or a database. It will be difficult for you to group these pods together once they are deployed. If you label them now as front-end, backend, or database, you will be able to filter the pods based on this label at a later point in time. Now, it's important to note that under metadata, you can only specify name or labels or anything else that Kubernetes expects to be under metadata. You cannot add any other property as you wish under this. However, under labels, you can have any kind of key or value pairs as you see fit. So it's important to understand what each of these parameters expect. So far, we have only mentioned the type and name of the object we need to create, which happens to be a pod with the name my app pod. But we haven't really specified the container or image that we need in the pod. The last section in the configuration file is the specification section, which is written as spec. And depending on the object we're going to create, this is where we provide additional information to Kubernetes pertaining to that object. This is going to be different for different objects. So it's important to understand or refer to the documentation section to get the information right. Since we are only creating a pod with a single container in it, it is easy. Spec is a dictionary. So add a property under it called containers, which is a list or an array. The reason this property is a list is because the pods can have multiple containers within them, as we learned previously. In this case, though, we will only add a single item in the list since we plan to have only a single container in the pod. The item in the list is a dictionary, so add a name and image property. The value for image is nginx. Once the file is created, run the command kubectl create f followed by the file name, which is poddefinition.yaml, and Kubernetes creates the pod. So to summarize, remember the four top level properties, API version, kind, metadata, and spec, and then start by adding values to them, depending on the object that you're creating. Once we create the pod, how do you see it? Use the kube control get pods command to see a list of pods available. In this case, it's just one. To see detailed information about the pod, run the kube control describe pod command followed by the pod name. This will tell you information about the pod, when it was created, what labels are assigned to it, what containers are part of it, and the events associated with that pod. In this demo, we're going to create a pod again, but this time, Instead of making use of the kubectl run command, we are going to create it using a YAML definition file. So our goal is to create a YAML file with the pod specifications in it. Now, there are many ways to do it. You could just create uh, one in any text editor. So if you're on Windows, you could just use Notepad, or if you're on Linux, um, as I am, just use a native editor like VI or Vim. An editor with support for YAML language would be very helpful um, in getting the syntax right. So instead of Notepad, a tool, a tool like Notepad++ in Windows or uh, Vim in Linux would be better. Now I'll talk more about tips and tricks and other tools and IDEs that can help uh, with this um, uh, more in the upcoming lectures. Uh, for now, let's stick uh, with the very basic uh, form of creating um, a YAML file using a VI editor uh, on my Linux system. So here I am on my Linux terminal, and I'm going to make use of uh, Wim uh, text-based editor to create this pod definition file. 
So the name of the file um, I'm going to call as pod.yaml and as seen in the lecture, we will start off with the four uh, root level elements or the root level properties that we that we saw, which are API version, kind, uh, metadata and spec. So we know that uh, the value of, for API version for a pod is v1. Uh, the kind is uh, pod with a capital P. So it is case sensitive. So uh, that's important. And metadata is a dictionary and it can have values where we define the name of the pod. So I'm going to use name uh, as nginx and we can have uh, additional uh, labels that we can specify under it. So labels, uh, again, is also a dictionary and it can have as many labels um, as you want under it. So we can specify a label, which is a key value pair, such as uh, app and nginx. And we can also add more labels like tier uh, uh, and set it to front end, anything that can help us group this particular pod. Next, um, we have to define the spec. So spec is also a dictionary. Um, it has an object called containers. So before we move on to that, uh, we have to make sure that we get the indentation right. For example, the app and tier are children of the labels property. So it has to be in the same uh, kind of vertical line here. And similarly, under metadata, you have name and labels, um, which are the children of metadata. So it, they both have to be uh, on, uh, within the same vertical line. Uh, so you have to make sure that the spacing is correct. Typically, it would be two spaces or a tab, but it is recommended not to use tabs. So always uh, stick to two spaces. Um, and stick to that throughout. So the next thing that we're going to configure is the container. So a container is a list of objects. Now we first give it a name. Uh, note that this is the name of the container within the pod and there could be multiple containers and each can have a different name. So one container could be named app and another container could be named uh, helper. Any name that makes sense to you we're going to use the same name as that of the container image. So we will just name it uh, Nginx. And the second object that we're going to add here is the image name, uh, which is the Docker Hub image name of the container that we're going to create. So uh, the image name is um, again Nginx. Um, if you're using other registries than Docker Hub, then make sure to specify the full path um, to that image repository here. Now remember that we can add uh, additional containers to the pod as well. So if you have to do that, um, we have to declare the secondary uh, element uh, to the list, which would be the second object in the list. So here I can, for example, add a busybox container using the busybox image, and that would be the second element of the array. So in this case, we're going to stick to one uh, single container. So I'm going to just uh, delete that. And I'm now going to hit escape uh, colon uh, WQ to save this file. And we will just use the cat command to make sure that uh, the file was created with the expected contents. So make sure the format is correct. Uh, so the name and labels are children of metadata and you can see that they are on the same uh, kind of vertical line. And similarly, labels have two children, which are the two labels, app and tier. And spec has a list um, and we are defining it as a list uh, with a hyphen followed by the objects. So we can make use of the kubectl create uh, command or the uh, kubectl apply command. So the create and apply command uh, kind of works uh, the same um, if you're creating a new object, right? You, you can either use create or you can use apply. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and we pass in the uh, file name using the dash f option and here uh, we can see that the pod has been created so let's check the status real quick and you can see that it's in container creating state and then when we check again we see that it's in a running state and as before if you want to get more details about the pod you can always run the kubectl describe command and specify the the name of the pod uh, and you should get a much more in-depth information about the pod Okay, so that's it for this demo. In the next uh, section, we will learn uh, some tips and tricks of developing YAML files um, easily 
uh, using IDEs. At any time during this course, if you feel you need assistance, head over to our community group. We have a thriving community on Slack where our instructors and teaching assistants hang out. So go to code.wiki slash community or scan this QR code to get an invite. Once you're in, explore the various channels available for learning different topics and feel free to post your questions in the respective channels. All right, thank you and I'll see you in our communities channel. Well, it's time for our second hands-on labs activity. Go back into the labs and access the labs for pods or click on the link given here. In this lab, you will create pods and also explore creating YAML files for pods. Once done, come back here and we will resume the course. Let us now talk about replica sets. So what is a replica and why do we need a replica set? Let's go back to our first scenario where we had a single pod running our application. What if for some reason our application crashes and the pod fails? Users will no longer be able to access our application. To prevent users from losing access to our application, we would like to have more than one instance or pod running at the same time. And that way, if one fails, we still have our application running on the other one. And the replica set brings the failed one back to ensure a predefined number of replicas are always running at all times. The replica set helps us run multiple instances of a single pod in the Kubernetes cluster, thus providing high availability. So does that mean that you can't use a replica set if you plan to have a single pod? No, even if you have a single pod, the replica set can help by automatically bringing up a new pod when an existing one fails. Thus, the replica set ensures that the specified number of pods are running at all times, even if it's just one or 100. Another reason we need replica set is to create multiple pods to share the load across them. For example, in this simple scenario, we have a single pod serving a set of users. When the number of users increase and if we were to run out of resources on the first node, we could deploy additional pods across other nodes in the cluster. As you can see, the replica set spans across multiple nodes in the cluster. It helps us balance the load across multiple pods on different nodes, as well as scale our application when the demand increases. So a pod has a one-to-one -one relationship with a node. A pod can only run on one node at a time. You cannot move a running pod from one node to the other. You'll have to kill it and recreate it on another node. Well, technically the scheduler decides which node a pod gets assigned to, and there are ways for you to control that, which is out of scope for this crash course. We discussed those in much more detail in our CKA course. For now, we will just stick to the basics. So a pod lives on one node, a replica set spans across the entire cluster, and a replica set can deploy a pod on any node in the cluster. It monitors the number of pods in the cluster and ensures enough is deployed at all times. Let us now look at how we create a replica set. As with the previous lecture, we start by creating a replica set definition file. So we'll name it replica set definition.yaml. As with any Kubernetes definition file, we will have four sections, the API version, kind, metadata, and spec. The API version is specific to what we are creating. In this case, the replica set is supported in Kubernetes API version apps slash v1. If you get this wrong, you're likely to get an error that looks like this. It would say no match for the kind replica set because the specified Kubernetes API version has no support for that. The kind, as we know, is replica set. And under metadata, we will add a name and we will call it, say, my app replica set. And we will also add a few labels app and type and assign some values to them. So far, it has been very similar to how we created a pod in the previous section. The next is the most crucial part of the definition file and that is the specification uh, written as spec. For any Kubernetes definition file, the spec section defines what's inside that object that we're creating. In this case, we know that the replica set creates multiple instances of a pod, but what pod? We create a template section under spec to provide a pod template to be used by the replica set to create replicas. Now, how do we define the pod template? It's not that hard because we already have done it in the previous exercise. Remember, we created a pod definition file in the previous exercise. We could reuse the contents of the same file to populate the template section. Move all the contents of the pod definition file into the template section of the replica set except for the first two lines, which are API version and kind. Remember, whatever we move must be under the template section, meaning 
they should be intended to the right and have more spaces before them than the template line itself. Now looking at our file, we now have two metadata sections. One is for the replica set itself. So that's what is here. This is the metadata section for the replica set. And the other is for the pod. So this is the section of the pod. It's as if taking the entire pod template and putting it inside this file. So there's, there's that hierarchy that you can see. And so we have nested kind of two definition files together and the replica set being the parent and that the pod definition is the child. Now there is something still missing. We haven't mentioned how many replicas we need in the replica set. For that, we add another property called replicas and we input the number of replicas that you need under it. In this case, we put the number three. So remember that the template and replicas are direct children of the spec section. So they're siblings and must be on the same kind of vertical line, having equal number of spaces before them. So replica set requires a selector definition. The selector section helps the replica set identify what pods fall under it. But why would you have to specify what pods fall under it if you have provided the contents of the pod definition file itself in the template? It's because replica set can also manage pods that were not created as part of the replica set creation process. So say for example, there were pods created before the creation of the replica set that match the labels specified in the selector. The replica set will also take those pods into consideration when creating the replicas. Now I will elaborate this in the next slide. For now, know that it has to be written in the form of match labels as shown here. The match labels selector simply matches the labels specified under it to the labels on the pods. The replica set selector also provides many other options for matching labels other than just what is shown here. So just remember that whatever label you provide here, this needs to match with whatever label is set on the pod that's given here. So these, these two needs to match. So to create the replica set, once the file is ready, run the cube control create command and input the file using the dash F parameter. The replica set is created. And when the replica set is created, it first creates the pods using the pod definition template as many as required, which is three in this case. To view the list of created replica set, run the cube control get replica set command, and you will see the replica set listed. We can also see the desired number of replicas or pods, the current number of replicas and how many of them are ready. And if you would like to see the pods that were created by the replica set, run the cube control get pods command, and you will see three pods running. Note that all of them are starting with the name of the replica set, which is my app replica set, indicating that they are all created automatically by the replica set. So what is the deal with labels and selectors? Why do we label our pods and objects in Kubernetes? Let us look at a simple scenario. Say we deployed three instances of our front end web application as three pods. We would like to create a replica set to ensure that we have three active pods at all times. And yes, this is one of the use cases of replica sets as we've just discussed. You can use it to monitor existing pods if you have them already created as it is in this example. In case they were not created, replica set will create them for you. So the role of replica set is to monitor the pods and if any of them were to fail, deploy new ones. The replica set is in fact a process that monitors the pods. Now, how does a replica set know what pods to monitor? We'd like the replica set to monitor these three pods specifically and make sure that these three are running at all times. There could be hundreds of other pods in the cluster running different applications. So this is where labeling our pods during creation comes in handy. We could now provide these labels as a filter for replica set while creating the replica set definition. Under the selector section, we use the match labels filter and provide the same label that we used while creating the pods. This way, the replica set knows which pods to monitor. Let's now look at how we scale the replica set. Say we created the three replicas and in the future we decide to scale to six. How do we update our replica set to scale to six replicas? Well, there are multiple ways to do it. The first is to update the number of replicas in the definition file to six. Then run the cube control replace command specifying the same file using the dash F parameter and that will update the replica set to have six replicas. The second way to do it is to run the cube control scale command using the replicas parameter to provide the number of replicas and specify the same file as input. You may either input the definition file or provide the replica set name 
in the type name format. However, remember that using the file name as input will not result in the number of replicas being updated automatically in the file. In other words, the number of replicas in the replica set definition file will still be three even though you scaled your replica set to have six replicas using the cube control scale command and the file as input. So the recommended approach is to always create YAML files and then edit the YAML files. That way there's no difference between the actual state of the environment and what's defined in the YAML files. There are also options available for automatically scaling the replica set based on load, but that is an advanced topic for another time. So let us now review the commands real quick. The cube control create command, as we know, is used to create a replica set. You must provide the input file using the dash F parameter. Use the cube control get command to see a list of replica sets created. Use the cube control delete replica set command followed by the name of the replica set to delete the replica set. And then we have the cube control replace command to replace or update replica set. And also the cube control scale command to scale the replica sets simply from the command line without having to modify the file. Well, that's all for now and it's time for labs activity. Click on the link to go directly to the lab for replica set. If you haven't enrolled in the labs already, feel free to enroll it, it's free of cost. And once you complete the labs, come back here and we will continue. Let's now talk about deployments. So we saw how to deploy an application to Kubernetes by creating a pod and deploying multiple instances using replica sets. But deploying and managing the number of replicas won't cut it when it comes to deploying applications for production use cases. When newer versions of application is released, you would like to upgrade your application instances seamlessly. When you upgrade your instances, you may want to upgrade them one after the other, and that kind of upgrade is known as rolling updates. Suppose one of the upgrades you performed resulted in an unexpected error, and you're asked to undo the recent update, you would like to be able to roll back the changes that were recently carried out. And finally, say for example, you would like to make multiple changes to your environment, such as upgrading the underlying web server versions, as well as scaling your environment and also modifying the resource allocations, etc. You do not want each change to be applied immediately after the change is run. Instead, you would like to apply a pause to your environment, make the changes, and then resume so that all changes are rolled out together. And all of these capabilities are available with the Kubernetes deployments. So far in this course, we discussed about pods, which deploy single instances of our application, such as the web application in this case. Each container is encapsulated in pods and multiple such pods are deployed using replica sets. And then comes deployment, which is a Kubernetes object that comes higher in the hierarchy. The deployment provides us with capabilities to upgrade the underlying instances seamlessly using rolling updates and undo changes and pause and resume changes to applications running on the cluster. So how do we create a deployment? Now, as with previous components, we first create a deployment definition file. The contents of the deployment definition file are exactly similar to the replica set definition file, except for the kind, which now is going to be a deployment. The API version is the same as a replica set, which is app slash v1. Now, if we walk through the contents of the file, it has an API version, the metadata, which has the name and labels and a spec that has template replicas and selector. The template has a pod definition inside it. It's all the same as before. Now, once the file is created, run the cube control create command and specify deployment definition file. Then run the cube control get deployments command to see the newly created deployments. Then run the cube control get deployments command to see the newly created deployment. The deployment automatically creates new replica set. So if you run the cube control get replica set command, you will be able to see a new replica set in the name of the deployment. The replica sets ultimately create pods. So if you run the cube control get pods command, you'll be able to see the pods with the name of the deployment and the replica set. So, so far, there hasn't been much of a difference between replica set and deployments, except for the fact that deployments created a new Kubernetes object called deployments. We will see how to take advantage of the deployment using the use cases we discussed in the previous slide in the upcoming lectures. To see all the created objects at once, run the cube control get all command. Now, once a deployment is created and you have a newer version of the app available, how do you upgrade your application? As before, one way is to update the deployment definition file to update the new image name with the newer version of the app. Once that is done, run the cube control apply command to apply the changes to the cluster. 
The imperative approach would be to use the kube control set image command and specify the deployment name and the image name like this. Now when you specify the image name, remember to specify the container name. So this name, this format, this name equals the image name. So the container name equals the image name. So this is going to be the name of the new image of the app. Well, it's time for labs. Click on the link to go to the labs directly. And if you haven't enrolled already, enroll for free. In this lab, you'll work on creating deployments and deploying applications to a Kubernetes cluster. Let's now talk about services in Kubernetes. So we have two sets of applications deployed on our cluster, a web server and a Redis server. So Kubernetes assigns a unique IP address to each pod in the cluster. The web server in this case has the IP 10.244.0.2 and the pod has the 10.244.0.11. These are the IP addresses assigned to pods in a Kubernetes cluster. So there's an internal network formed and all the pods have internal IP addresses with which they can kind of communicate with each other. So in our example, the web server needs to access the Redis service. So here's the code of our web server. And what do you think would be the address that the web server should put here to connect to the Redis service? The Redis pod has an IP address. Now, can the web server address the Redis service using its IP address? Now it can technically, but it shouldn't because this IP is for each pod and it is bound to change if the pod were to crash or restart for some reason. So you don't really want to kind of tie down the IP address into code, of course. So that's where a service comes in. So a service enables communication between applications within a Kubernetes cluster. So think of a service as a proxy or a load balancer, although it technically is not in a traditional sense and it provides an endpoint for other services to connect to. In this case, we create a service named RedisDB and now the web application can refer to the service with the name RedisDB. Now, similarly to expose the web service outside to the external users, you would create another service for the web server. We will call it the web service. So a service enables connectivity between applications within the cluster as well as to expose applications outside the cluster to end users. Now we'll see how to create service in a few minutes, but first let's understand the different kinds of service. So the first one that we discussed is the cluster IP service. This is a service within the cluster that is not exposed externally and helps different services communicate with each other. This is the example that we saw about the web server reaching the Redis service. The Redis DB service is a cluster IP type of service. The second is the node port kind of service. And in this case, the service exposes the application on a port on the node to be made accessible to the external users. So this is the example where the web service is made accessible to external users through a node port on the node. The third type is a load balancer where it provisions a load balancer for our service and supported providers like Google Cloud or AWS or Azure. A good example of that would be to distribute load across different web servers on these cloud environments. Now in the scope of this course, we will look at the cluster IP and node port services. So let's look at the cluster IP type of service. The service we talked about earlier where the web server tries to connect to the Redis service is the cluster IP type of service. So this is pretty straightforward. So here we have a Redis pod that needs to be exposed within the cluster for the web application. We do that by creating a service, but we know that pods are usually deployed in replicas, multiple instances, and there could be hundreds of other pods in the cluster. Now, how can a service identify which are the pods that it should be routing traffic to? Again, same as before, we have labels and selectors. The pods have a label with a name set to Redis pod. We define the same label as a selector on the service. The service identifies all pods with the same label and configures them as its endpoints. To create such a service, as always, use a definition file. In the service definition file, first use the default template, which has the API version, kind, metadata, and spec. The API version is v1, kind is service, and we will give a name to our service. We will call it RedisDB. Under spec, we have type and port. The type is cluster IP. In fact, cluster IP is the default type. So even if you didn't specify it, it will automatically assume it to be cluster IP. Now, under ports, we have a target port and port. The target port is the port where the backend is exposed, which in this case is 6379. And the port is where the service is exposed, which is 6379 as well. Now I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a sec, but just to continue here, to link the service to a set of pods, we use selector. 
So we will refer to the pod definition file and copy the labels from it and paste it under selector. And that should be it. We can now create the service using the cube control create command and then check its status using the cube control get services command. The service can be accessed by other pods using the cluster IP, which is given here. But a better approach is definitely using the, the name itself, the service name. So let's talk about ports. When creating a service, we must specify what port the application running inside the pod is listening on. And that's defined as the target port here. So here we have 6379. That's the, the port that Redis service is listening on the pod. So that's the target port that is specified here. Now we also need to specify which port the service itself must serve on. And these could be different. So the application could be listening on one port and the service could be listening or exposed on another port completely. However, in this case, since any application connecting to Redis expects it to be at 6379, we're just going to stick to the same port. So if you look at the code of the web server to connect to the Redis service, it must use the name of the service as the host, which is what it is in this case. In this case, it's Redis DB and use the same port defined as a port on the service, which in this case is 6379. Let's look at what a node port service is next. So a node port is a type of service where a normal service is created first and is then exposed to external users through a port on the node. So in this case, we're uh, looking at the web server, which is something that we expect to be available or exposed to external users. And if you look at this pod, there's a single pod. The port on the pod where the actual web server is running is 80. And it is referred to as the target port because that is where the service forwards the request to. The second port is the port on the service itself and it is simply referred to as port and remember these terms are from the viewpoint of the service and finally we have the port on the node itself which we use to access the web server externally and that is known as the node port as you can see it is 30008 so that is because node ports can only be in a valid range which is from 30000 to 32000 767. So let's take a look at how to create the service. As before, we will use a definition file to create a service. So the high level structure of the file remains the same. We have the API version, kind, metadata, and spec. The API version is v1. The kind is service. The metadata will have a name and that will be the name of the service. It can have labels, but we don't need to do that for now. Next, we have spec. And as always, this is the most crucial part of the file as this is where we will be defining the actual services. And this is the part of a definition file that differs between um, different objects. So in the spec section of a service, we have type and ports. The type refers to the type of the service we are creating. As discussed before, it could be cluster IP, node port or load balancer. In this case, since we are creating a node port, we will set it as node port. The next part of the spec is ports. This is uh, where we input information regarding what we discussed on the left side of the screen. So the first type of port is the target port, which we set to 80. The next one is simply port, which is the port on the service object. And we will set that to 80 as well. The third is the node port, which we will set to 30,008 or any number that's in the valid range. Now remember that out of these, the only mandatory field is port. If you don't provide a target port, it is assumed to be the same as port. And if you don't provide a node port, a free port in the valid range between 30,000 and 32,767 is automatically allocated. Also note that ports is an array. So note the dash under the port section that indicates the first element in the array. You can have multiple such port mappings within a single service. So we have all the information in, but something is really missing. There is nothing here in the definition file that connects the service to the pod. We have simply specified the target port, but we didn't mention the target port on which pod. There could be hundreds of other pods with web services running on port 80. So how do we do that? So as we did with previously with replica sets and, and the cluster IP service, we're going to use labels and selectors. So we have a new property in the spec section called selector. Under the selector, we provide a list of labels to identify the pod. For this, refer to the pod definition file that we used earlier to create the pod, pull the labels from the pod definition file and pasted it under the selector section. 
So this links the service to the pod. And once done, we create the service using the cube control create command and input the service definition file. And there you have the service created. To see the created service, run the cube control get services command that lists the services, their cluster IP and the map ports. The type is node port, so as we created, and we can now use this port to access the web service using curl if you are within uh, within the Kubernetes cluster or web browser if you're accessing it externally. Now, so far we talked about a service mapped to a single pod, but that's not the case all the time. What do you do when you have multiple pods? In a production environment, you have multiple instances of your web application running for high availability and load balancing purposes. In this case, we have multiple similar pods running on a web application. They all have the same labels with a key name set to Redis pod. So the same label is used as a selector during the creation of the service. So when the service is created, it looks for matching pods with the labels and finds three of them. The service then automatically selects all the three pods as endpoints to forward the external requests coming from the user. You don't have to do any additional configuration to make this happen. And if you are wondering what algorithm it uses to balance load, it uses a random algorithm. So thus the service acts as a built-in load balancer to distribute load across different pods. Now, as you can imagine, at times you may want to have other algorithms and other settings when load is balanced. So that's where service meshes come in like Istio and Linkerd. So we do have some courses for that on Code Cloud if you want to see, but as in the scope of this crash course, we will not be covering that. So let's finally look at what happens when the pods are distributed across multiple nodes. So in this case, we have the web application on pods on separate nodes in the cluster. When we create a service without us having to do any kind of additional configuration, Kubernetes creates a service that spans across all the nodes in the cluster and maps the target port to the same node port on all the nodes in the cluster. This way, you can access your application using the IP of any node in the cluster and use the same port number which in this case is 30,008. It's also available on any node where even if the pods are not scheduled on that node, even those nodes will expose this application or the service through the node port, which is 30,008. So to summarize, in any case, whether it be a single pod in a single node, multiple pods on a single node, multiple pods on multiple nodes, the service is created exactly the same without you having to do any additional steps during the service creation. When pods are removed or added, the service is automatically updated, making it highly adaptive. Now, once created, you won't typically have to make any additional configuration changes. So it's time for labs for services. So click on the link to go directly to the labs. If you haven't enrolled already, enroll this course for free. In this lab, you will work on creating services to expose applications within and outside a Kubernetes cluster. Well, I'll see you back here once you're done with the labs. Hello, and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we will try and understand microservices architecture using a simple web application. We will then try and deploy this web application on multiple different Kubernetes platforms, such as Google Cloud Platform. I'm going to use a simple application developed by Docker to demonstrate the various features available in running an application stack on Docker. So let's first get familiarized with the application because we will be working with the same application in different sections through the rest of this course. This is a sample voting application which provides um, an interface for a user to vote and another interface to show the results. The application consists of various components, such as the voting app, which is a web application developed in Python to provide the user with an interface to choose between two options, a cat and a dog. When you make a selection, the vote is stored in Redis. For those of you who are new to Redis, Redis in this case serves as a database in memory. This vote is then processed by the worker, which is an application written in .NET. The worker application takes the new vote and updates the persistent database, which is a Postgres SQL in our case. The Postgres SQL simply has a table with the number of votes for each category, cats and dogs. In this case, it increments the number of votes for cats as our vote was for cats. Finally, the result of the vote is displayed in a web interface, which is another web application developed in Node.js. This resulting application 
reads the count of votes from the Postgres SQL database and displays it to the user. So that is the architecture and data flow of this simple voting application stack. As you can see, this sample application is built with a combination of different services, different development tools, and multiple different development platforms such as Python, Node.js, .NET, etc. This sample application will be used to showcase how easy it is to set up an entire application stack consisting of diverse components in Docker. Let us see how we can put together this application stack on a single Docker engine using Docker run commands. Let us assume that all images of applications are already built and are available on Docker repository. Let us start with the data layer. First, we run the docker run command to start an instance of Redis by running the docker run Redis command. We will add the dash d parameter to run this container in the background, and we will also name the container Redis. Now, naming the containers is important. Why is that important? Hold that thought. We will come to that in a bit. Next, we will deploy the Postgres SQL database by running the docker run Postgres command. This time too, we will add the dash D option to run this in the background and name this container DB for database. Next, we will start with the application services. We will deploy a front-end app for voting interface by running an instance of voting app image. Run the docker run command and name the instance vote. Since this is a web server, it has a web UI instance running on port 80. We will publish that port to 5000 on the host system so we can access it from a browser. Next, we will deploy the results web application that shows the results to the user. For this, we deploy a container using the results app image and publish port 80 to port 5001 on the host. This way, we can access the web UI of the resulting app on a browser. Finally, we deploy the worker by running an instance of the worker image. Okay, now this is all good, and we can see that all the instances are running on the host. But there is some problem. It just does not seem to work. The problem is that we have successfully run all the different containers, but we haven't actually linked them together. As in, we haven't told the voting web application to use this particular Redis instance. There could be multiple Redis instances running. We haven't told the worker and the resulting app to use this particular PostgreSQL database that we ran. So how do we do that? That is where we use links. Link is a command line option which can be used to link two containers together. For example, the voting app web service is dependent on the Redis service. When the web server starts, as you can see in this piece of code on the web server, it looks for a Redis service running on host Redis. But the voting app container cannot resolve a host by the name Redis. To make the voting app aware of the Redis service, we add a link option while running the voting app container to link it to the Redis container. Adding a dash dash link option to the docker run command and specifying the name of the Redis container, which is, which in this case is Redis, followed by a colon and the name of the host that the voting app is looking for, which is also Redis in this case. Remember that this is why we named the container when we ran it the first time, so we could use its name while creating a link. What this is in fact doing is it creates an entry into the etc host file on the voting app container, adding an entry with the host name Redis with the internal IP of the Redis container. Similarly, we add a link for the result app to communicate with the database by adding a link option to refer uh, the database by the name DB. As you can see in this uh, source code of the application, it makes an attempt to connect to a Postgres database on host DB. Finally, the worker application requires access to both the Redis as well as the Postgres database. So we add two links to the worker application, one link 
to link the Redis and the other link to link Postgres database. Note that using links this way is deprecated and the support may be removed in a future in Docker. This is because, as we will see in some time, advanced and newer concepts in Docker Swarm and networking supports better ways of achieving what we just did here with links. But I wanted to mention it anyway so you learn the concept from the very basics. So we just saw how the voting application works on Docker. Let's now see how to deploy it on Kubernetes. So it's important to have a clear idea of what we are trying to achieve and plan accordingly before uh, we get started. So we already know how the application works and it's a good idea to write down what we plan to do. So our goal is to deploy uh, these containers, these applications as containers on a Kubernetes cluster and then enable connectivity between the containers so that the applications can access each other uh, and the databases and then enable external access for the external facing applications, uh, which are the voting and the result app so that the users can access the web browser, right? So how do we go about this? Now, we know that uh, we cannot deploy containers directly on Kubernetes. Um, we learned that the smallest object that we can create on a Kubernetes cluster is a pod. So we must first uh, deploy these applications as a uh, pod on our Kubernetes cluster. Or um, we could deploy them as replica sets or deployments um, as we have seen um, through, throughout this course. But uh, first, for the sake of simplicity, we will stick to pods uh, in this lecture, right? And later we will see how to easily convert that uh, to a deployment. So once the pods are deployed, the next step is to enable connectivity between the services. So it's important to know what the connectivity requirements are. So we must be very clear about what application requires access to what services. We know that the Redis database is accessed by the voting app and the worker app. The voting app saves the vote to the Redis database and the worker app reads the vote from the Redis database. We know that the PostgreSQL database is accessed by the worker app to update it with the total count of votes and it's also accessed by the result app to read the total count of votes to be displayed in the resulting um, web page in the browser. So we know that the voting app is accessed by the external users, um, the voters, and the result app is also accessed by the external users to view the results. So most of the components are being accessed by another component except for the worker app. Note that the worker app is not being accessed by anyone. You can see arrows going into uh, all of these um, components, but there are no arrows going into worker, which means none of the other uh, components or external users are accessing the worker app. The worker app simply reads the uh, count of votes from the Redis database and then updates the total count of votes uh, on the PostgreSQL uh, database. So none of the other uh, components, uh, nor the external users, ever access the worker app. Now, while the voting app has a Python web server that listens on uh, port 80, and the result app also has a uh, Node.js based uh, server that listens on port 80, and the Redis uh, database has a service that listens on port 6379, and the PostgreSQL database has a service that listens on port 5432. Uh, the worker app has no service because it's just a worker and it's not accessed by any other service or external users. So keep that in mind. So how do you make one component accessible by another? Say, for example, how do you make the Redis database accessible by the voting app? Should the voting app uh, use the IP address of the Redis pod, perhaps? No, because that can change. The IP of the pod can change if the pod restarts. And it, you may also run into issues when you try to scale your applications in the future. The right way to do it is to use a service. Now we learned that a service can be used to expose an application to other applications or users for external access. So we will create a service for the Redis pod 
so that it can be accessed by the voting app and the worker app and we will call it a redis service and it will be accessible anywhere within the cluster by the name of the service redis so why is that name important the source code uh, within the voting app and the worker app are hard coded to point to a redis database running on a host by the name redis so it's important to name your service as redis so that these applications can connect to the redis database and this is not a, a best practice to hard code stuff like this uh, within the source code of an application instead you should be using environment variables or something but for the sake of simplicity we will just follow um, this application uh, as it is developed right now these uh, services are not to be accessed outside the cluster so um, they should just be of type cluster IP so we will follow the the same approach of creating a service for the PostgreSQL pod so that the PostgreSQL DB can be accessed by the worker and the result app so what should uh, we name the PostgreSQL service if you look at the source code of the result app and the worker app you will see that they are looking for a database at the address db so the service that we create for uh, postgresql should be named db also note that uh, while connecting to the database the worker and the result apps uh, pass in a username and password to connect to the database both of which are set to postgres so when we deploy the the postgres db pod we must make sure that we set the these credentials um, for it as the initial set of credentials to while creating the database now the next task is to enable external access so for this um, we saw that we could use a service with a type set to node port so we create uh, services for voting app and the result app and set their type to uh, node port now we could decide on what port we are going to make them available on and it would be a high port um, with a port number greater than 30,000. Uh, so we'll do that when we create the service. So we are done and we have the high level steps ready. So to summarize, we will be deploying five pods in total and we have four services. Uh, one for Redis, another for Postgres, both of which are internal services. So they are of type cluster IP and we then have external facing services for voting app and the result app. However, we have no service for the worker pod and this is because it is not running any service that must be accessed by another application or external users. So it is just a worker process that reads from one database and updates another. So it's not going to require a service. Now, I say that again as that's a common question that I get when we talk about services. Uh, why does this worker not require a service? Right? So a service is only required if the application has some kind of uh, process or database service or web service that needs to be exposed, that needs to be accessed by others. In this case, that's, that's not true for the worker app. Now, before we, um, we get started with the deployment, note that we will be using the, the following Docker images for these applications. So these images are built um, from a fork of the original um, developed at the Docker uh, samples repository. Uh, the image names are uh, code cloud slash um, example voting app underscore vote uh, with a tag of v1 and then again uh, worker v1 uh, result v1. And for the databases we will use the official uh, Redis and PostgreSQL releases uh, that are available right so that's it for now uh, and we will see this in action in the upcoming demo in this demo we're going to deploy the voting application on our minikube cluster so here i have created a new project folder called voting app so the first thing that we are going to do is to create the pod definition files for each component within the application uh, so let's begin with the voting app itself. So we will name this uh, pod definition file as voting app uh, pod uh, .yaml. And let us build uh, this pod from scratch. So we will uh, begin with the API version and set it to v1 and the kind will be pod. The metadata section would have the name um, which will be voting app dash pod. 
and let's add a couple of uh, labels uh, the first label would be the name which can be the same as uh, the name of the pod which is voting app dash pod and the second label will be the name of the application which is the demo voting app so we'll kind of use that label for all the components part of this application stack that way we can group uh, the components of a single application together by assigning the same kind of label to all of them but there would still be a different label for each component to differentiate from each other so let's add the spec section and uh, here the first thing that we're going to add is the name of the container so we'll use uh, voting app as the name of the container and the image we will make use of the custom image that we have built from the docker samples uh, voting app git uh, repository page which is here so we will use the custom images that we built under the code cloud docker hub repository the name of the image here is code cloud uh, slash example voting app underscore vote with a tag of uh, v1 now we will also specify the port for this voting application as a container port uh, property so this should be uh, the port on which the application listens for this voting app and we know that it's port 80 so we'll set it to port 80. Uh, next let's create the pod definition file for the result app so again i'm going to create a new file here called a result app pod and and because uh, this is a um, pod definition file like uh, like before we can uh, simply copy the template from the voting app file we just created and then uh, we will just make changes to the name um, and labels and the image so let us change the name to result app pod and we will make the same uh, change to the label and then um, the app label will remain the same as all of these are part of the same app and again let's make the change to the container name uh, to result app and here the image will also be changed to code cloud uh, slash example voting app underscore result and uh, with the same tag of v1 and the result application is also exposed on the container port 80 so we will leave that um, as is next uh, let's create the pod definition file for the redis pod so i'm going to name the pod definition file as redis-pod.yaml and again i'm going to make use of the previous pod as the template and we will change the name of the pod so we'll change it to redis pod and we will use the same as the label and let's name the container as redis and the image should be also be uh, redis and the container port for redis uh, we will change it from port 80 to 6379 because this is the default port um, for the redis image so let's save this and now let's create another pod now this time for our database um, we'll name it um, uh, postgres-pod.yaml and as before we're going to copy uh, paste one of the pod definition files here and we'll make changes to the name so this one will be postgres-pod and the same for the label now the name uh, of the container would be postgres and the image um, we can also use the postgres image itself uh, without any tag which means that it will make use of the latest uh, postgres image the container port for postgres uh, ql database uh, is 5432 by default so we will add that in and we also have to add a couple of other environment variables here so this is to make sure that we specify the postgres username and password for the database so as we saw in the previous lecture the source code of the worker and the result pod has the password for the post uh, postgresql database hard coded in them so we must specify the initial password to be set for the database here as um, environment variables now a better way to do this uh, would be to use uh, secrets or um, some kind of vault to pass in these uh, credentials and not have these credentials in a plain text format in a file but those are out of scope uh, for this course um, we discuss about these concepts in much detail 
in our advanced courses on Kubernetes, the CKA and CKAD courses. We discuss about environment variables, services, um, and secrets, um, and other concepts. So for this uh, example to work, um, we have to make sure that we specify these two environment variables in the Postgres um, pod definition file. So for this, we will make use of um, an env section, uh, which is a list of uh, dictionaries, and we will have the environment variable name and value entered in them. So it must be um, Postgres underscore user for the username and Postgres underscore password in um, as a password um, all in caps. Now the value for both um, would just be Postgres uh, for now. And again, um, just to reiterate, we are adding these values because the worker pod and the result pod uses these credentials while connecting to the database. And if you don't configure this, the worker will not be able to connect to the uh, database. And as a result, the total voting uh, count may not add up, right? So in case uh, you run into issues with the vote count not updating, or not able to view the results, then this is probably uh, an area that you can check. So now we've created four pods, the Postgres pod, the Redis pod, the two front-end application pods, um, the result app and the voting app. The last one is the worker pod. So let's create a new file uh, for the worker pod, uh, workerpod.yaml, and I'm going to copy and paste the definition file. So in here, let's make uh, changes to the name. So let's change the name to worker pod and the same for labels. And the name of the container will be worker app and the image is uh, worker instead of uh, vote. And one important uh, change here is that we must remove uh, the ports section because as we discussed, um, the worker app has no services listening. So no port uh, definition is required. So as a result, uh, we can delete uh, this entire section over here. So we now have uh, five pod definition files um, for all our microservices. Next, we will create services to expose uh, these pods, um, except for the, for the worker. So let's get that going. Let's start by creating the service uh, definition files. So let's start with uh, one of the internal services, which is uh, Redis. So we'll call the file as redis-service.yaml. Uh, so we will start with uh, the API version, which is v1, and the kind is service. Uh, let's add the metadata. And the name of the service uh, we will use as Redis itself. So remember that uh, this is important and we'll add a couple of labels. The name would be set to redis-service. Uh, and the second one is the, the one we have been using for all the other objects, which is demo voting app. Now, uh, next we will add the uh, spec section and within this, um, we will add the ports. So uh, for Redis, uh, we know that the port to be used is 6379. And we'll also add the target port, um, which is uh, also going to be 6379. Now we don't need to specify um, anything else like a node port because this is going to be an internal service. Now let us add the selector. Uh, so in order to link the service to the pod, we must specify the same labels configured for the pod. So let's copy the labels from the pod definition file and we'll paste it under the selector section. Um, now, since this is an internal service, we're not going to expose it outside um, on the network, so that, that should be good. So this file is now complete. Uh, so let's save it, and uh, next we will proceed with the creation of the Postgres uh, service. So now let us create the Postgres service file. We'll follow the same approach as before. We'll name this as Postgres uh, service.yaml. And the easiest way to create a service uh, now is to just copy the contents of the Redis service file and paste it here. So again, we will make the appropriate change. So if you remember the architecture from the lecture, the name of the Postgres database must be DB. So this is because a worker app expects the name of the Postgres database to be DB. So if you name it anything else, you'll find that the connection will fail. So uh, we'll now change the labels. 
Um, these labels could really be anything, so it doesn't really matter. Let's uh, name it as Postgres service, and we can even name it as uh, DB service. And let's change the, the the port to 5432 because that's the port in which the Postgres database runs. And again, this will be 5432. Uh, 5, and let's make sure that we copy the labels from the pod definition file. So here we will copy the name uh, label, which is uh, set to Postgres pod. Uh, so let's delete the older uh, selectors and uh, the, the labels and then replace it with the new one. So now we're done with the two uh, internal services. Let's now proceed to creating the external facing services, uh, which is the voting service and the results service. So uh, let's start with the voting app service. Let's create a new file called voting app service.yaml and we will copy the contents of the other file and then paste it here. Again, let's change the name to voting service. Let's change the label as well. And we we know that this is a front end application which runs on port 80. So let's uh, set that port number um, as the service port and uh, as the target port. And uh, as before, uh, we'll copy uh, the labels uh, from the pod definition file. So the next step uh, would be to create the final service, which is uh, the result service. So let's call the file as the result app dash service dot yaml. And let's copy the voting app service uh, definition file into here. And then again, we change the name to result and everything else is the same. And we will update the, uh, the selector section uh, with the labels um, of the pod, the result uh, app pod. We actually created them as internal services like the others. Now, we have created the voting app and result app service as internal services like, like the others, but they are supposed to be externally accessible. So we must set their type to node port. So since we have not specified any type, it would be um, considered as cluster IP. So let's do that now. And each service requires, uh, we'll set the uh, type to node port. And uh, each service also requires an additional port specification uh, for the node port. And uh, we will set that to 30,004 for the voting app. Okay, now we will go and uh, update the same on the result uh, service. So we will set the uh, uh, type to node port and we will add a node port uh, port number of 30,005 for the result app service. Okay, so we are done with all the all the files. If you have completed the creation of all the pod and service uh, YAML definition files, and we will now proceed with the creation of these objects, and, and we will then try to access um, the application on the web browser. So we will switch to the uh, terminal of our system, and um, we are in the voting app directory, and which is where we created all the pod and uh, service definition files. So now we can uh, start creating these objects. So first, uh, let's check if there are any pod or deployments or services running on the server. So uh, when we see, we see that there are there's nothing except for the default Kubernetes service. There is uh, there's nothing else running. So let's start with the pod uh, and the, the service for the voting application, right? So we'll start uh, with one by one and we'll test and make sure that they're, they're working as expected and then we'll proceed further. So to create uh, the pod, we will use the kubectl create command and specify the pod definition file. And uh, similarly, let's create the service using the service definition file for voting app. So let us now inspect the status of the pod and the service. So if we want to see the, the pod and the service in a single command, we can run the kubectl get pods command and specify the uh, service as SVC uh, separated by a comma. And so it will list uh, both um, the objects. So uh, we can see that the service uh, for the voting app uh, is created and it is of type node port and the pod is also uh, created and it is in a running state. Now, before we proceed further, let's test to see if that bit is working, right? So um, what we could do is simply access the voting app service using a URL 
um, which could be formed by the IP of the Minikube node. So if you know the IP, you could just use uh, the port number, which is 30004, uh, the port number of the service and view it in a browser. Um, or if you're not sure about the IP, you could run the command Minikube uh, service and uh, specify the name of the service uh, with the dash dash URL option. Okay, and it'll give you uh, the URL that you can use. So we'll copy the URL and we will try to access this in our local browser on my system. Um, so here I'm at the local browser and I'm going to try and access this. And as you can see, we are now able to load the voting application. So that's uh, that's one step uh, which is complete. Now let's not try and cast any vote for now as we don't have the databases ready. Now let's go ahead and create the remaining objects. Um, the pods and services. So back to the terminal, the next pod um, and service that um, we created is the Redis pod. So we run the kubectl create command with the Redis pod definition file and then the service file. And as before, uh, we run the kubectl get pods uh, and service command. And as you can see, the Redis pod and service are created. Uh, the service is now the cluster IP because this is an internal service. And uh, let's create the Postgres database now. Uh, we'll create the Postgres database with the uh, Postgres pod definition file. And as well as the service definition file for creating the service. Again, let's check the status. And uh, we can see that the Postgres pod is in a running state. And similar to the Redis service, uh, we can see uh, also that the Postgres um, service is up as well with its name set to db right so now that uh, both our redis and postgres pods and services are up and running we can now create the the worker pod and to do this we will use the uh, kubectl create command with the worker pod definition file so let's uh, check the status of the pod and I can see that the worker pod is also now in a running state. Now, finally, let us create the pod and service for our result application. So let's do the, the same thing as before. Uh, keep um, run the kubectl um, create a result app command. And uh, let us run the uh, uh, create the result app service as well. Okay, so now let's check the status of all the pods and services. And now you can see that all of our five pods are up and running. And we can see that uh, we have two node uh, port uh, services, one for our result service and one for our voting service. Um, the other two services that we created are the Redis and database service, which are internal only. Uh, so we have already accessed uh, the voting application. Uh, let us also generate the URL uh, for our uh, result service. Uh, so for that, I'm going to use the same command as before, uh, the minikube service voting service uh, command will give us the URL to access our voting app. And let us change the, the name here uh, to get the, uh, the URL of the result app. Okay, so we now have both the URLs. So let's go back um, to our web page. And here we have the voting application, which is running on port 30004. Uh, let's copy and uh, paste uh, the new URL. So this is going to uh, be uh, 30,005. Um, so let's try and uh, uh, cast a vote here. So I'm going to click on um, the dogs as selection. And here you can see that uh, there's a check mark against the vote that we selected, which indicates that our vote has been recorded. You know, uh, as in it has been saved in the Redis database. And you can also see that uh, below that there's this particular web page is being processed by the voting app pod. Now, if we go to the results uh, page, you can see that the uh, the docs um, application has 100% um, of votes because in this case, we just have one vote and that was for docs. And I can also change that vote if I, if, if I want. So uh, I could go back and click on cats and I can see that uh, the result has changed to cats. So that's our demo. Uh, we have successfully deployed a multi-tier application on a Kubernetes cluster, and we have confirmed uh, that it's working, right? Um, so the data actually goes through uh, from one end all the way through the, through the Redis database, through the worker pod, uh, to the uh, PostgreSQL database, 
and up to the the result part so it's working as expected okay so this is what we saw in the last demo so we deployed pods and services um, to keep it really simple and we were able to access our application um, from a browser uh, but uh, deploying applications as just pods has its own challenges Deploying pods uh, doesn't help us scale our application easily if we wanted to add more instances of a particular service. And if you wanted to update uh, the application, like an image uh, that was used in the application, then your application will have to be taken down uh, while the new uh, pod is created. So that, that may result in, in a downtime. So the right approach is to use deployments uh, to deploy an application. So uh, let us now improvise our setup using deployments. So we choose uh, deployments over replica sets as deployments automatically create replica sets as required and uh, it can have um, it can help us uh, perform rolling updates and rollbacks and maintain a record of revisions and record the cause of change uh, as we have seen in the previous demos. So deployments are the way to go. So we'll add uh, more uh, pods uh, if required for the front-end applications like voting app and result app um, by, by creating a deployment and setting the, the replicas to three. Uh, we'll initially start off with just one replicas for all uh, for each of these components and later we'll see how um, easy it is to scale them to three or more, right? So um, we will also encapsulate the databases and uh, the worker applications um, within deployments. So let's take a look at that uh, now. So here I am in the Visual Studio code, and this um, is the project directory, which has all the pods and service definition files. So let's create a new file um, for the deployments. So we'll start with uh, the voting app itself. So I'll name this file as uh, voting app-deploy.yaml, and I'm going to use the, the split screen function so that I can open the pod and the deployment definition file side by side. So let's create uh, the deployment file for the uh, building the application by using the pod definition file as the template. So let's start with the API version and it will be um, apps uh, slash v1. The kind uh, will be deployment and let's add the metadata. Uh, the name uh, of the deployment would be voting app dash deploy and uh, we'll add some labels. Uh, next, uh, let's add the uh, spec section. Um, so it has already uh, pre-populated a couple of uh, entries for us. So we should be specifying the number of uh, replicas. Um, and for all our uh, pods, we're just going to stick to one replica uh, to begin with. And uh, since we are on a single node uh, cluster uh, to save some resources. And under the selector section, I'm going to add the labels uh, from the pod. So we use uh, the match uh, labels uh, option and then we will copy and paste uh, the labels over from the pod definition file. Um, now under the template section I'm just going to copy everything from the metadata um, to the end of the file and then paste it under the template section. Uh, once done we fix the formatting. Alright so that looks good. Uh, so let's proceed with the uh, next deployment, which will be the Redis deployment. So again, I open a Redis, uh, the Redis pod definition file. And just like before, we create a new file called redis-deploy.yaml. And then we will copy the contents of the voting app uh, deployment file um, just to get started. And we will change the name of the deployment to Redis Deploy and the, the same for labels as well. So we'll stick to um, uh, Replica 1. And uh, we will copy the labels from the uh, pod definition file for Redis. And then we copy over the template from the pods and then paste it um, and then fix the formatting. So that's done and we will proceed uh, with the Postgres uh, QL deployment. Uh, let's copy the Redis uh, deployment file and I'll open the Postgres pod definition file for reference. And let's make the changes to the names and labels and update the selector labels uh, with the ones on the pod.
and then move over the uh, the definition um, under the template section and then we fix uh, the formatting okay so that looks all right um, next let's proceed with the worker so we're going to close this let's create a worker app deployment file and we will copy and paste the template um, and update the name and let's copy the labels uh, from the pod definition file and put it under the, uh, the selector section and uh, the same as before let's copy the uh, pod uh, manifest file and paste it under the uh, the template section so that's the deployment for worker and now we are left with uh, one for the result app so again uh, we close these uh, two and here is our uh, result app uh, we will create a new file result app deploy.yaml and we copy and paste a template again and we update the name and labels um, and the template as we did before So we are now done with all our uh, deployment definition files and I'm going to get rid of uh, all of this. So here is uh, all the new deployment files that we, we created. And now let's uh, head back to our terminal and create these deployments uh, along with the services. So before we do that, let's make sure that uh, there are no pods and services running in the cluster. So we have uh, cleaned up everything that was created for the previous um, demonstration so there are no pods or services uh, other than the default uh, kubernetes one and now let's refresh and make sure that all our deployment files um, have been created so here uh, we have the five new deployments that we created and the the services uh, will remain the same so we'll first start with the the voting app uh, deployment so we'll create uh, it using the kubectl create uh, command and pass in the voting app deployment file as input and uh, let's also create the service and let's do a quick check on the deployment and make sure that it's running so yes uh, we see that it is in a running state so now let's create uh, the redis deployment and followed by the redis service and similarly let's create the postgres uh, deployment and the postgres service and let's make sure that um, uh, everything is up so we see uh, that all the pods are up uh, the deployments um, are running one out of one pods, which means that the pods um, are up and running. And let's check the service. So we have uh, the DB service, uh, we have the Redis service, and the voting uh, app service created so far. So now let's uh, clear the screen and we create the worker deployment. Now remember, the worker does not have a service. So let's make sure that everything is uh, running as, as expected. And we see that the worker pod um, uh, of the deployment is running as well. So finally, we create the result app deployment and the result app service. And we now see that uh, everything is running as expected. So let's uh, change this to um, deployment comma uh, SVC. So we have all the, um, the five deployments in a running state and we have four services. So now let's uh, get the URLs uh, for our two front-end services. So we'll use Minikube uh, service and the name of the service with the URL flag. And let's do the same for the result service as well. And um, we get the URLs um, with the ports 30,004 and 30,005. So now um, I'm going to launch the web browser and we'll try to access these applications so let's look at the the first url which is the voting app itself and let's get the vote and let me open another window here which uh, will go to 30,005, and you can see that the result is shown um, as expected so now i'm going to scale up the deployment so run the kubectl scale command and specify the number of replicas to three to add two more you know replicas for the voting application so when we run the uh, get deployments command, um, we see that there are three pods for the voting app right now. Now, if we now go to the uh, URL and refresh the page each time, we see that the page is served by a new pod uh, each time. So we see how easy it is to scale our applications uh, with deployments.
Well, that's it for this demo. I will see you in the next. So here we are at the end of this crash course. I hope you enjoyed the material. We have covered the basics of containers, Kubernetes, pods, replica sets, deployments, and services in this course, and also deployed an example voting application. However, that's only the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot more when it comes to learning Kubernetes. There are these different ways of provisioning a cluster, administering a cluster, maintaining and upgrading a cluster, logging and monitoring, security, backups, storage, networking, auto-scaling, designing a cluster for hosting production-grade applications, and much more. Now, all of these are covered in our Kubernetes learning path at CodeCloud. This involves three certification courses, the CKAD, the Certified Kubernetes Application Developer course, that's for application developers to get familiarized with building applications to be deployed on Kubernetes, the CKA course, the Certified Kubernetes Administrators course for sysadmins who are responsible for managing a cluster, the CKS course, the Certified Kubernetes Security Specialist course for security engineers, and other tools in the cloud native ecosystem that work with Kubernetes like Helm, Customize, service meshes like Istio, Linkerd, GitOps principles like Argo CD, at CodeCloud, we also cover a wider spectrum of content, such as Linux. We're the only learning platform where we teach Linux by doing using our hands-on labs. And of course, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our channel as we release new videos about cloud native and Kubernetes all the time. Hello, and welcome to this lecture on setting up Kubernetes. In this lecture, we will look at the various options available in building a Kubernetes cluster. So there are a lot of ways to set up Kubernetes, we can set it up ourselves locally on our laptops or virtual machines using solutions like Minikube or Micro K8s. These are solutions for developers or those who want to just play around and learn Kubernetes. The Kube Admin tool is used to bootstrap and manage production grade Kubernetes clusters. There are also hosted solutions available for setting up Kubernetes uh, in a cloud environment, such as GCP, AWS, Azure, or IBM Cloud, and many others. We also have a demo on provisioning a Kubernetes cluster on GCP. And of course, these are just a few among the many options available to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. So you may really follow any of these approaches to set up a Kubernetes cluster, but to go through this course, you don't really need to set one up. As part of this course, we give you a real Kubernetes cluster that you can access right in your browser with the click of a button without having to set anything up. And we have guided challenges and fun hands-on lab exercises that will get you familiar with Kubernetes in no time. In this section of the course, we will just start with one of these options. The remaining examples are in the appendix section at the end of this course. So we will start with the mini cube option, which is the easiest way to get started with Kubernetes on a local system. If mini cube is not of interest to you and you just want to rely on the online labs, then now would be a good time to skip this lecture. So before we head into the demo, it's good to understand how it works. Earlier, we talked about the different components of Kubernetes that make up a master and worker node, such as the API server, the etcd key value store, controllers and scheduler on the master, and the kubelets and container runtime on the worker nodes. It will take a lot of time and effort to set up and install all of these various components on different systems individually by ourselves. Minikube bundles all of these different components into a single image, providing us a pre-configured single node Kubernetes cluster so we can get started in a matter of minutes. The whole bundle is packaged into an ISO image and is available online for download. Now, you don't have to do that yourself. Minikube provides an executable command line utility that will automatically download the ISO and deploy it in a virtualization platform such as Oracle VirtualBox or VMware Fusion. So you must have a hypervisor installed on your system. For Windows, you could use VirtualBox or Hyper-V, and for Linux, you could use VirtualBox or KVM. And finally, to interact with the Kubernetes cluster, you must have the kubectl Kubernetes command line tool also installed on your machine. So you need three things to get this working. You must have a hypervisor installed, uh, the kubectl utility installed, and minikube executable installed on your system. 
In this demo, we are going to install a basic Kubernetes cluster using the Minikube utility. As part of this uh, beginner's course, to keep things simple and easy, we will stick to Minikube as our lab solution. We explore additional options of provisioning a Kubernetes cluster using the Kube admin tool um, in the CKA course. As for this course, we just want to stick to the very basics and all the basic operations uh, can be performed on a Minikube cluster. So we will start uh, at the kubernetes.io page. Uh, within this website, click on the documentation section and navigate to tasks and install tools section. Now, before installing Minikube, uh, we must install the kubectl uh, utility. Uh, it may be called kubectl or kubectl or kubectl, uh, whatever you prefer. Now, you might uh, hear me uh, mix it up at times, so bear with me on that. So the uh, kubectl command line tool is what we will use to manage our Kubernetes resources and our cluster after it is set up using Minikube. Uh, installing the kubectl utility before installing Minikube will allow Minikube to configure the kubectl utility to work with uh, the uh, cluster when it provisions it. So the kubectl utility can work with multiple clusters, uh, local or remote clusters, uh, at the same time. Uh, there's a small configuration for it, and Minikube will automatically take care of that uh, when it starts, uh, when it provisions a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but that is if you already have the kubectl utility installed, so that's important. Now, our goal is to set up a cluster on our local machine. I'm on Linux uh, uh, Ubuntu system, uh, but the same procedure will also work on Windows or Mac operating systems as well. Now, all the demos and tools uh, that we have throughout this course will work on all um, operating systems, Linux, Windows, or Mac. Okay, you just need to follow the respective installation procedure uh, for your OS. And to start with, I'm going to install uh, the kubectl uh, utility on my Linux system, and we're going to go ahead with the latest version. So just copy and paste the command uh, provided here for downloading the uh, kubectl binary. Uh, the binary uh, has now been downloaded. The next step is to make this command executable. So I'm going to use the command uh, chmod plus x uh, to make it executable. And finally, we're going to move this to a location within the path um, user local bin. Okay, so this way I'll be able to run this kubectl command uh, from anywhere within my system. So let's run uh, the kubectl version command and you can see that it has installed the 1.18 version. Now what we just saw was one way of installing a kubectl utility. There are other ways to do it. You can install it using a package managers depending upon the type of distribution, um, the OS distribution that you are on. And the documentation associated uh, with these are available um, here. So if you scroll down, um, you will see that there are instructions for installation on Mac OS, and there should be one for Windows as well. So make sure that uh, you use the appropriate link and set up kubectl uh, based on the documentation provided. Now that we have completed the installation of uh, kubectl utility, we can proceed with the installation of Minikube. Now, the first thing that we have to check, um, and this goes for all operating systems, Linux, Windows, or Mac, is to make sure that virtualization is enabled for your laptop or desktop, wherever you're setting up this lab. So one of the easy ways to make sure that virtualization is enabled on Linux is to uh, grep for the VMX or the SUM keyword under the proc CPU info file. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do now. So as long as this command shows an output um, such as the switches listed here, uh, virtualization has been enabled and you don't have to uh, enable it specifically from the BIOS. If it's not enabled, then you have to check your laptop's uh, BIOS settings 
So you have to restart your laptop, go into the BIOS, and there should be an option to enable virtualization, and you have to do that. Um, you might have to check your laptop's manual um, in order to uh, know how that's done, or just uh, check online uh, with your laptop's model uh, and search how to enable virtualization on your laptop. And again, make sure that you check the documentation here uh, for the respective operating system that you are on. Uh, for each of these, there are specific commands that can be used to run a test um, to see whether virtualization has been enabled. Okay, so next we are going to install Minikube. And again, we will go ahead with the option for Linux. And the first prerequisite is to install uh, kubectl, which we have already done. The next one is to install a hypervisor. So for Linux, uh, we can either use KVM or VirtualBox. Um, we uh, will go with VirtualBox as that is our preferred virtualization uh, solution. You can also run Minikube without a hypervisor and directly on your host using Docker. So if you already have Docker installed, you could leverage that um, and have Minikube uh, you know, provision a Kubernetes cluster uh, using a Docker container. However, note that uh, as you can see here in the documentation page, um, there's a warning that says it can result in security or data loss issues. So we will just stick with a virtual machine based approach for now. Uh, I just prefer VirtualBox because it can, uh, in case you mess up something um, on your system and you need to restart, it's easy to get rid of the VM and restart again, right? It won't really mess up your laptop. And you can take snapshots before you make a major change and then you can restore to that snapshot in case that change you know, doesn't really well work well for you. Now, VirtualBox is supported on all variety of operating systems, including Linux, Windows, and OS X. So I'm going to open this um, in a new window and it takes me to the download section. And here I'm going to select uh, Linux distribution and the one that is most appropriate um, for my system. Uh, you may choose one that is appropriate for yours. So wait for it to complete uh, the download and then we will install VirtualBox. It has downloaded the Debian package, so I'm just going to install it directly. Um, wait for the installation to complete, and while it installs, uh, let's go back to the documentation section. So now the installation has been uh, completed and I'm just going to close this and I'm going to launch uh, VirtualBox. So as you can see here, um, this is what the VirtualBox interface looks like. And you will have a similar interface for Windows or Mac um, with minor differences, but that should not matter. So right now, we don't have uh, any virtual machines running. So when we provision a cluster using Minikube, it will automatically create a virtual machine as required. So apart from just installing VirtualBox, you don't really have to do anything directly with it. Now let's proceed with the installation. So the next step is to install the Minikube utility. Again, there are different ways to do this. Either use the package manager uh, and install it as a package, or we can do it using a direct download approach. So we're going to download the latest version. And just like we did with the kubectl utility, I'm going to curl the package and then install it on my machine. So I'm just going to copy the whole thing and this will download the minikube binaries and assign an execute bit so that you know, we can run it as a command. And once that has been done, let us add minikube to our path. The user local bin directory has already been created so we don't have to do that first step. We will run this command to install Minikube at the location slash user slash local slash bin. Next, uh, we will provision a Kubernetes cluster using the Minikube utility. So we're going to run the Minikube start command but we also have to specify the driver name to be used with this command. 
Now, Minikube can work with different virtualization tools, and that's where you must specify what driver to use. In our case, we use VirtualBox. So let's open this link and make sure that you we are using the correct driver name. So the name of a VirtualBox driver is VirtualBox. So we'll make use of that name. Um, so I'm going to copy and paste this command until the driver name. And then I'm just going to copy the driver name from this page and paste it here. We will now execute the command. Uh, when it starts, you'll notice that um, it follows uh, a process. So it is in fact uh, downloading the ISO image for Minikube. And then this is the image that uh, will be used to provision a VM on VirtualBox. We now see that it's downloading Kubernetes version 1.18.3 and um, any other required binaries. Uh, let me switch to the VirtualBox UI and we will see that a virtual machine by the name Minikube has been created and it is in a running state. And you can see that the VM uses two CPUs and two GB of RAM. So let's wait for this uh, setup to complete. Okay, so now uh, this has been installed and um, KubeCuddle utility is now configured to use uh, the Kubernetes cluster provisioned using Minikube. So let's head back to the documentation page. And the next thing that we are going to do is um, run the uh, Minikube status command to ensure that everything has been set up correctly. So I'm going to uh, clear the screen here and then run the Minikube status command. We can see that uh, the Minikube uh, control plane, kubelet, API server, and kubeconfig are um, all in a running and configured state. So that's good. Uh, if you run into issues with uh, the installation anytime, feel free to run this command and check the status. So our cluster is now set up. We will deploy some applications on the cluster and make sure it's working as expected. Now we will get into talking about the different concepts on deploying an application in the upcoming lectures. Right now, we just want to make sure that the cluster we set up is working as expected. So we will simply follow the tutorial given in this page although it may not make total sense now, but I assure you that we will get to that in a bit. So click on this link under what's next. And here we have some examples that could uh, be used to test our setup. In the new page, you can skip the first step of starting a Minikube uh, cluster. So uh, we have already done that. So the next thing that we need to check is if kubectl commands are working. So I'm going to run the kubectl get nodes command and you can see that uh, it is a single node cluster and the node name is Minikube and it is in a ready state. Uh, and it was spun up about eight seconds ago and it's running the latest uh, release of uh, Kubernetes, which is 1.18 as of this recording. So next, uh, let us try to create some deployments using this cluster. So here we have an example on this page. Uh, I'm going to run kubectl create deployment command to create the deployment. Once that is done, uh, we will run the kubectl get deployments command. And you can see that uh, the hello minikube deployment has been running for 22 seconds. Next, uh, we will expose this deployment as a service. Uh, for that, make use of this command here. And kubectl expose uh, deployment uh, hello minikube command. Now, don't worry about the command for now. We'll talk about this uh, in much detail later in this course. For now, we'll just copy and paste. Okay, and then we will skip to step five, where we will get uh, the URL of the exposed service. So by running this command, uh, copy the URL and paste it into a browser on your laptop. And it should list uh, the details about the application like this. Okay, so that's not the most exciting application, but this is proof that your setup is working. And that's all we need for now. Now follow the remaining instructions to clean up your system, uh, delete the services and delete the deployment.
Uh, the deployment will be in a terminating state for a few seconds. And after it's done, the application will no longer be accessible on the web page. Thank you.